Uh, so speaking of our guest, um, Dr. Peter Kuzneski, also known as Dr. K, I'll call him Dr. K. Uh, a little bit of background uh, about him. He grew up as the youngest in a family of six kids. He was a typical Catholic until his college years. He went to Georgetown University for a year before realizing that he really loved philosophy. So he switched to Thomas Aquinas College down in Southern California. There, he experienced his first, um, shall we put it, well done Novus Ordo liturgy. And he thought, wow, this is, this is you know, amazing. And then, he, at the same school, he discovered the Latin Mass. And he just fell head over heels for that um, and just loved it ever since. After TAC, he pursued a Master of Arts and Doctorate in Philosophy from the, the Catholic University of America. And then his career in academia continued beyond, beyond school, where he became a professor at the International Theological Institute of Austria. He was a pillar in the founding of Wyoming Catholic College and has been involved with college students and young adults for many years. Uh, he is married with two children. His eldest son is in the Benedictine Abbey in Ireland, Silver Stream, and his daughter is currently at Wyoming Catholic College. Now, Dr. K focuses most of his time currently on authoring very insightful books on the church, on tradition, music. Have you written them? I haven't posted a book yet on music. Okay, that's not coming. yet. That's coming. Um, the liturgy, and is also a speaker. So, um, before I turn over the podium, I just wanted to have this little plug. I had the privilege of taking him to, uh, wine tasting this morning. And, <laughs> and and out to lunch, and I went with my brother and, and two friends, and he is such a joy to talk to. So intelligent, well read, balanced in his approach to the, to a lot of difficult subjects that we threw at him, but also not afraid to make a controversial point and allow discussion to flow from that and try to reach some broad new understanding of, of the topic. So I really encourage you to ask him a lot of questions during the Q and A and stick around and ask for your questions later. Um, for those of you that like reading blogs, Dr. K writes for 1 Peter 5, Horati Chaley. He also writes for the newspaper, The Remnant. You can also find a lot of his talks on YouTube as well. Um, he has authored or edited 19 books, which have been translated into 18 different languages, and which some, some of which will be for sale in the table back there after the talk. And then the last just housekeeping item, uh, so the, the Q and A is when you'll ask the questions. So just wait till the end of the talk, and then Dr. K will prompt you all for for questions. So now the moment you've all been waiting for, Dr. Kuznetsky. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you for coming out today. Uh, I appreciate it. It's a good good audience on a beautiful day in a beautiful place. So thank you to the Infraeros for hosting us. Um, good. All right. Um, have have a, have I have a lot of ambitious topics to, to, to uh, attack today. You know, this is called prayer, music, and dating. I, I'm not really. I, I don't uh, claim to be an expert in any of these areas. I think that one would be foolish to to claim such a thing. But but I do have. I have thought about these things for a long time. I've tried to practice them in my own life. Um, I've observed a lot of young people making good and bad decisions. Uh, and so I try to learn from all these things and, and share with you what I've, what I've discovered. Do we realize that without God, we are nothing? We would not even exist without him causing us to be at every moment. We would not be able to act without him acting in us. We cannot achieve virtue, holiness, or happiness without him. Jesus put it best, without me, you can do nothing. We have a profound need to pray every day. Our interior life will wither up and eventually dry out if we do not have recourse to prayer every day. And when we lose our interior, we become an empty shell. Our Lord says in the Gospel of John, no longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends, for all that I have heard from my Father I have made known to you. He has given us the gift of his friendship by sharing his life, his truth, 
his peace, his grace with us. We can describe the Christian life as an ongoing conversation with Christ so that our friendship with him can grow ever deeper. When we die and come before our Lord, we want him to recognize us as familiar friends and welcome us into his kingdom instead of saying, I do not know you. For he is not merely a friend like any other friend. He is the Lord of glory, the great king over all the earth, our maker, our savior, and our judge. Our relationship with him should therefore be characterized not only by familiarity and intimacy, but also by the most profound worship, reverence, and self-surrender. This ongoing conversation with our Lord happens in many ways, in personal prayer, whether formal or informal, with or without words, in reading and pondering scripture, even in our contacts with other people in whom we try to see Christ and relate to him. But the highest and most exalted encounter with our Lord in this life takes place in the public prayer of the church, what we call her sacred liturgy, which consists of the rites of the sacraments, the divine office, and above all, the holy sacrifice of the mass, in which our Lord makes himself present so that we may give perfect worship to the Father in union with him and receive him as the food of immortality. He wants us to live his very own life. He wants us to breathe with his spirit. He wants to touch our soul and body with his healing, transformative presence. Saint Athanasius said, God became man that man might become God. So really bold words. If you want God to become your own and yourself to become God's own, then you must let God enter you in the way he has chosen, under the form of bread as your nourishment. We need this daily bread like never before, to prepare us and strengthen us for our struggles with Satan and his evil angels and their human dupes. Dom Prosper Guéranger says, the Holy Spirit has made the liturgy the center of his working in men's souls. Saint Peter Julian Emar, the great apostle of the Eucharist writes, quote, know, O Christian, that the mass is the holiest act of religion. You cannot do anything to glorify God more nor profit your soul more than by devoutly assisting at it and assisting as often as possible, unquote. The cure of ours, St. John Vianney, adds, <clears throat> quote, quote, all the good works in the world are not equal to the holy sacrifice of the mass because they are the works of men, but the mass is the work of God. Martyrdom is nothing in comparison, for it is but the sacrifice of man to God, but the mass is the sacrifice of God for man." Unquote. There's a saying, live your life as a thanksgiving for your last mass and as a preparation for your next mass. The Holy Mass and the Holy Eucharist at its heart is the golden thread that binds together our days and years as we walk through this life of trial and tempest to the city of eternal peace. Now, I understand that not everyone can get to a daily traditional Mass, or maybe not even more than once a week. Maybe the location is too far away or the time conflicts with your work or school schedule. Our inability to make it to Mass regularly should, however, be seen as a privation, as a loss to be regretted. We can even offer it up to God as a form of suffering, as a form of longing, really, and as something we will try to overcome as soon as our life circumstances permit. Often young adults are so focused on their studies or their career or their relationships, all of which are important, that they neglect somewhat their spiritual or interior life, which deserves to have primacy. It's a good idea to take stock once in a while of where you are and where you're going and to see if, for example, you could eventually get a different job that would allow you to make it, ma to, make it to mass more, more often or if you could move closer to a Latin mass parish. Those who cannot get to daily mass might consider taking up a hand missile to meditate on the day's readings and prayers. This is what some call a dry mass or reciting part of the breviary or doing a meditative rosary if you're not already doing these things. Given where we're at in the liturgical year, we celebrate one of St. Joseph's two annual feasts tomorrow. So tomorrow, May 1st, is St. Joseph the Worker. It seems appropriate to reflect for a moment on his example. He is described in scripture with a remarkably simple phrase. He is called the just man. 
But when you consider how much of the Old Testament is taken up with jaw-dropping stories of the horrible sinfulness of mankind, including the chosen people Israel, to call a fallen son of Adam a just man is to say quite a bit. After all, what is justice? Justice is the virtue by which we give to another what we owe him. St. Thomas Aquinas says that the greatest form of justice is the virtue of religion, by which we give to God that which we owe him, as much as it lies in our power to do so, and in accordance with what he asks of us. Religion, that is the virtue of religion, has a number of ingredients, devotion, prayer, adoration, sacrifice, and tithing, to name the most important. By our devout will to serve him, by raising our minds to him in petition and praise, by adoring him as our Lord and God, by offering sacrifices, in all these ways we try to give to our creator and savior what we owe him. St. Joseph would have practiced all these virtues of religion to perfection, and that is why he was acceptable and pleasing in the sight of the Lord. Modern people tend to think of religion as a purely interior and spiritual thing, but it is not. It has radical implications for our life in the world, what we do with our words, our bodies, our time, our money, our property, our senses. We also tend to be antinomian or inclined to lawlessness in the sense that we, I mean we, not as in like this group here, but modern people, think of law as a burden and an imposition, as something that inhibits our freedom. Instead, we should have the attitude of Psalm 118, which praises God's law as the ultimate mercy and liberation because he tells us how to act in order to be good and righteous in his sight, how to be happy or better, blessed in this life and in the next. Law and freedom are not only not opposed, they are mutually necessary. Freedom without law degenerates into the slavery of bad habits, that is vices, which then compel us to act in self-destructive ways. By shaping and governing our freedom, the law of God strengthens us in adhering to what is truly good for us. This mention of law inclines me to pull back to the bigger picture. Why are we Christians? The reason is that we believe Christ is God and God is truth and happiness. And if we want even a remote shot at a happy human life and everlasting life, this is our one and only path to it. Christianity requires from us a radical commitment of faith that I will be faithful to God, come what may, through thick and thin, because he has already proved his fidelity to me. That is why we have crucifixes everywhere. It is not just the symbol of our redemption from sin and death, that is something done in the past for us. It is the sign of God's commitment to each one of us here and now. As the Curie of Ars said, the Mass is God's sacrifice for us. I once heard an acronym that has really stuck with me as a key explanation of why we tend to be so flaky in our Christian life. The acronym is FOMO, fear of missing out. Have you heard this? Yeah, okay. We are often weak at doing good and tempted to, to go the way of the world because we think that we will miss out on something if we are morally good if we are pure and self-controlled, if we refrain from living the way worldly people live, we will miss out on the fun, the entertainment, the pleasure, the excitement, the adventure. This, to be quite frank, is the biggest illusion the devil has ever manufactured. The real adventure is being caught up in the eternal and the infinite, the ecstasy of God's love, and joining forces with the saints and angels who are vastly more lovable, more powerful, and more interesting than the pathetic cardboard cutout figures of typical modern Western secular surface dwellers. In advertising, in the media, everywhere, the modern world shouts the lie, you can have or do everything you want. False. Some things are mutually exclusive. For example, choosing a life of drinking, drugs, or sexual promiscuity will necessarily exclude purity, nobility, stability, inner strength, a conscience at peace, and a life marked throughout by good or even great deeds. You can't have everything. If you choose the Christian life, it will exclude reckless partying, casual hookups, liberal politics, etc. You will miss out on something. The key is to have no fear of missing out on things that are worth missing out on because they are stupid, shameful, harmful, or deadly. 
I finally understood after many years why the church so often repeats a particular psalm verse at mass in the introit. Noli emulari in malignantibus, neque zelaveris facientes iniquitatem. This is probably said 50 times a year in the Latin mass. It means wish not to emulate evildoers nor envy them that work iniquity. It's talking about the FOMO principle, it seems to me. There are basically two kinds of life we can lead, a Christian one or a worldly one. Some people try to straddle these two, getting drunk one night and going to confession the next day. But this kind of two-faced gymnastic act will only last so long. One either has to pull oneself together and be a Christian or give it up and surrender to the world, the flesh, and the devil. No man can serve two masters, said our Lord, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. The early Christians were well aware of the alternatives. An ancient document called the Didache says there is the way of life and the way of death. It's pretty stark. The way of the world is slippery. Once you step onto it, you begin to slide down, down, down. Pretty soon you will find yourself enslaved and feeling there's no way out. The way of Christ is liberating. Once you commit yourself to it in earnest, you begin to taste what it's like to be both the master of your life and the servant of the one who is the true master of life. Statistics show, and I would say experience confirms soon enough, that the secular way of life is not glamorous, free, and full of delights, as advertising and pop culture want us to think. The people who are confused, lonely, despairing, bored, and running away from their problems, and who often commit suicide, are the ones who have embraced secularism as their creed. True joy is not found there. Where is true joy? At the Last Supper, telling and showing his disciples how much he and his father love them, our Lord said to them, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and your joy may be filled. True joy is in the love of Jesus in his heart. From it flows forth every true and pure and lasting joy we can have. So if we want to have a pure and noble mind, an upright heart, a clean and clear-sighted conscience, interior self-command and self-respect, then we must not let ourselves be enslaved to the gods of this world, to their false philosophies and false priorities. For we cannot have both. We cannot do whatever we want, look at and listen to and try out anything and everything and still be disciples of Christ. If we want the goods he promises, we have to part ways with the evils he condemns, the evils that will dilute and pollute our faith, our hope, and our love. It is a radical decision and one on which the whole direction of our life here and hereafter hinges. But unlike the Protestant way of thinking, it is a decision we make each day not just once for all, as we get down and kneel and make our morning offering, as we reorient ourselves to the first beginning and last end of our lives. Christianity doesn't promise an easy or successful or pleasant life. Then again, the secular world can't deliver that either, even though it promises to. What our faith gives us, or rather what God's grace gives us, is the strength to face any hardship, whatever it may be the strength of character to be upright, noble, and pure in whatever we do or suffer, the possibility of self-knowledge and of abiding, satisfying friendships with others, the peace of a clear conscience and the hope of everlasting bliss. The religion of secularism, for it is truly a set of dogmas and practices as strict as any religion, undermines all of these goods. It makes them impossible to desire or achieve. It lowers and limits the horizon of what we are and what we can become. You and I are supposed to be, just to use an expression that I've heard used, important individuals who make a difference. But how do we do that? Our job, the only one God has given to us, is to become saints. And in so doing, to make a difference in a world gone mad by its loss of God, and in a church gone soft from its lukewarm members. We will do this primarily by prayer, by the study of the word of God, by stability in our vocations, and by giving fearless witness whenever and wherever demanded. 
For some, it will involve a more active apostolate, fighting on the battlefield. For others, on the contrary, it will mean withdrawing into silence, penance, and contemplation. So let's return to St. Joseph. St. Joseph is also the silent man. Not a single word of his is recorded in the New Testament. Not everyone, needless to say, is called to be a Carthusian monk or nun who lives in nearly total silence. But I doubt you will contradict me if I claim that all of us could use some more silence in our lives. God has so much to tell us, such profound and lofty mysteries, so overflowing with indescribable joy, that he does not engage in chit-chat or texting, but speaks heart to heart in prayer, in scripture, in the liturgy. That means if we want to hear him, we need to open up a space of silence every day. This is why all the spiritual masters say we should commit some sacrosanct portion of the day to quiet prayer. And we should find ways to reduce the constant noise that surrounds us in the form of music, videos, and social media. Way back in 1935, the poet T.S. Eliot said that moderns are, quote, distracted by distraction from distraction, unquote. What would he say today with Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, and Lord knows what else? I don't even know all the stuff that's out there. Silence is uncomfortable. We flee from it because sooner or later it will make us think about ourselves, about God, life, the universe, our happiness or lack thereof. And these are uncomfortable if we are not yet who, we, who and what we ought to be. Conversely, for someone who is really striving to be a just man like St. Joseph, silence is no longer an uncomfortable no man's land, but a welcome opportunity to be alone with God, yet never lonely. Let me pass on a recommendation I once heard someone else make, which has made a difference to me. When you're in the car or public transportation, don't automatically turn on the radio or stick in the earbuds. Learn to be quiet. Say some prayers or psalms instead. Give yourself plenty of downtime from social media. It's very hard to do, I know it from experience. But the benefits are huge, and even secular people are writing book after book about why our psyche benefits from this downtime. I think it's the new form of asceticism. We need to fast from too much consumption of media. Some recommend the Sunday shutdown, that is, leaving all devices turned off on Sundays. Go to a park and take a walk in nature, listening to the natural sounds the world makes. If you don't take steps to put up appropriate walls, various kinds of noise will invade your life and colonize your mind, and you will become a messy room cluttered with whatever other people want to put there, and not much room will be left for yourself or for God. I'm going to tell you something that almost no one says anymore. We have to be intelligent and countercultural when it comes to what we watch and listen to. Our habits of movies and music need to be in harmony with our Christian faith. This is something St. Paul was already telling the Philippians way back in the early church when there were similar problems. I mean, they didn't have social media, obviously, but they had pagan festivals full of lewdness and the violent games where spectators would watch condemned criminals fight each other to the death. St. Paul said, quote, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things." Unquote. That's Philippians 4.8. I'm going to read this again. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. In other words, let your mind be filled with good things. Just as we all know that eating healthy foods is good for the body, so we should consume only what is healthy for the soul. Implied is a warning. Do not think about, let alone linger over and absorb like a sponge, the contrary of what is true, modest, just, holy, lovely, etc. For that will make your soul less Christian and less fully human. We don't see here the false belief that the way to become a fuller person is to be exposed to a lot of evil, if only vicariously, so that one can better understand it and combat it. I've heard people make this argument before. It's a weak argument. 
uh, to which proponents of modern media so often have recourse. Pope John Paul II once asked, what truth can there be in films, shows, and radio and television programs dominated by lust and violence? Do these really serve the truth about man? Father Dominic Legge explains, quote, when we watch acts of lust or cruelty, we tend to become more lustful and cruel. What you look on with your eyes, you invite into your soul. How much of the so-called entertainment fair of our age falls into this category? Unquote. Another result of watching lust and cruelty is that one can become indifferent to it and even callous about it, becoming numbed to the objective moral evil being portrayed and sluggish in reacting with appropriate disgust. In the movies, dozens, hundreds, thousands of people get shot up on the screens in front of us. Life is cheap and violence is good entertainment. Should we be surprised when moderns are prepared to throw away the lives of the unborn children or the elderly? Sexual content is treated as a non-negotiable titillation, and in general, evil is treated as a spice in the recipe. Should we be surprised at the promiscuity, cheapness, and weirdness of modern sexual behavior when images of the same are regularly impressed on the imaginations of millions of people? We should prize and protect our interior purity and quietude. It is difficult for fallen creatures like ourselves to follow St. Paul's injunction to the Colossians. He says, set your minds on things above, not on the things of the earth. So that, as he says elsewhere, we may remain unstained in the midst of a corrupt generation. It is already difficult enough to achieve inner silence and recollection for prayer. I mean, anybody who's tried to pray knows that it's difficult. It takes at least five minutes to get your mind actually clear so that you can do something which could be possibly called prayer. <clears throat> so it's difficult enough in any situation to do that. One wonders then what the great mystics would say. Think of St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross, St. Therese of the Child Jesus, St. Elizabeth of the Trinity. Would they not consider most of what modern people watch today to be, at best, a colossal waste of time, at worst, a pollution of the soul? We should adopt for all media the wise attitude of St. Basil the Great towards pagan authors. He has in mind something like Homer's Iliad or Homer's Odyssey, which was the, the standard textbook fare of children in his, in his era. He says, quote, when they, the pagans, recount the words and deeds of good men, you should both love and imitate them, earnestly emulating such conduct. But when they portray base conduct, you must flee from them and stop up your ears, as Odysseus is said to have fled past the song of the sirens, for familiarity with evil writings paves the way for evil deeds. Therefore, the soul must be guarded with great care, lest through our love of letters, he means pagan literature, it receives some contamination unawares, as men can drink in poison with honey." Unquote. If that is true of literature, which is a pretty tame form of entertainment, is it not a thousand times more true of movies and TV and many other forms of today's popular entertainment? Movies exercise a kind of strong magic because they fill the soul with hyper-defined imagery. Our memories and dreams become saturated with what we watch and listen to. For St. Paul, the matter is clear. He says to the Ephesians, quote, fornication and all impurity or covetousness must not even be mentioned among you as is fitting among saints. Let there be no filthiness nor silly talk nor levity which are not fitting, but instead let there be thanksgiving, unquote. That's Ephesians chapter five. He writes to the Corinthians, Quote, do I make my plans like a worldly man, ready to say yes and no at once? As sure as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. Unquote. If we need sophisticated and elliptical arguments to justify something we are listening to or watching, or for that matter, reading, we are probably guilty of trying to say yes and no to Christ at the same time. How a Christian lives his life, what he spends his time on, where he puts his mind and heart should be utterly consistent with the faith he professes. The word of God exhorts us to vigilance, careful discrimination, and a holy ruthlessness with our tendency to cut corners, make excuses, and relax standards. So am I saying we should never watch movies or TV? 
I don't even know if TV is a thing anymore, but you know, shows online. Okay. It's easier to say TV. No, I'm not saying that, definitely not. There's a very large number of movies that do not indulge gratuitously in evil. Obviously, there's a whole library of classic films. There are more recent films tastefully done, documentaries, docudramas, stage plays turned into movies, nature films, animated films, and so forth. If one were using media moderately, that is not binge watching, one would never run out of good films to watch. You know, I think that you could say that pretty, pretty fairly. So I'm not saying it's that the medium is evil. I'm just talking about the, the general content nowadays is, is flawed, it's very flawed. Then there is the question of music. In my high school days, I used to listen to a wide range of rock and rap music. Um, probably mostly bands that nobody listens to anymore, but anyway. At a certain point, thanks to a charismatic prayer group at church, I started taking my Catholic faith more seriously, as Augustine mentioned. I began to pay attention to the lyrics of the music I was listening to and noticed how vulgar and stupid they often were. And that's a fact. It was not difficult to see that the musicians, too, at closer look, were anything but models of virtue. At about the same time, thanks to a required music appreciation class in which we listened to works like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, I became aware of how the music of the great composers spoke to many levels of my being. I don't know if I could have expressed it well back then. I just knew that the music was a whole lot more complex in its melodies, harmonies, and rhythms. Over time, this music started making sense as I listened to it. As a at a certain point, it occurred to me that I no longer wanted to give the rock and rap artists, artists my time, my money, or most importantly, access to my soul. And that, fortunately, there was a wider, deeper musical world out there. People living in the modern democratic Western world think that the music we listen to is a matter of indifference, just superficial entertainment with no moral consequences. That happens to be a minority opinion in the history of human thought. I really want to emphasize that. Music has a profound effect on the formation and development of our human potential and moral character. This is the teaching of Plato, Aristotle, St. Augustine, St. Thomas Aquinas, Arthur Schopenhauer, Friedrich Nietzsche, Joseph Pieper, and Joseph Ratzinger, among other heavyweights. And surely, when philosophers who disagree about so much else agree on this major point, this agreement should make us pause and think. According to Plato and Aristotle, whenever we listen to music, we are allowing it to come inside and make its home in our souls. We are saying, shape me, make me like yourself. We wouldn't sleep with just anyone or entrust our education to any teacher. Yet, will we allow sordid characters and their cheap goods to enter the doors and windows of our body and live inside our minds and hearts? But so far, I'm painting with a broad brush. We can be more specific about what's wrong with certain kinds of music and what's good about more artistically refined music. Rhythm is the most basic element of music, the most primitive. This is why the music of some primitive cultures consists mostly of drumming. More advanced cultures, presupposing the framework of rhythm, develop beautiful melodies above it. The most advanced cultures, presupposing both rhythm and melody, develop a system of harmony. When you listen to a piece by, for example, Palestrina, Bach, Mozart, or Tchaikovsky, the rhythm, although discernible, is subordinated to the melody and harmony which takes center stage. Pop, rock, rap, metal, and other such popular styles invert this rational hierarchy of rhythm, melody, and harmony. They accentuate the beat, strip the harmonic framework to a bare minimum, and employ repetitious, unlyrical melodies, if they can even be called that, in order to stimulate the concupiscible and irascible sense appetites in a disordered manner. Now, to put that in everyday language, that means the music is designed to stimulate passions like desire and anger. That's concupiscible and irascible. We are dealing here with music deliberately primitive, passionate, and sensual. It is one thing for such music to proceed from genuine savages who know no better, but it is quite another for it to proceed from the descendants of a rich folk culture and a resplendent high culture like we have. In this case, 
It is a rejection of one's own inheritance, not necessarily a culpable one, but just objectively, that's what it is. We are the beneficiaries of over 1,000 years of glorious Western music, a heritage that has no parallel in any other human civilization. This is our heritage, yours and mine, something that has been passed down to us. Each one of us as a rational animal, as a citizen of the West, and as a Christian, should take hold of it and take advantage of it. As men, as believers, we should be striving for excellence, not only spiritual and moral, which I think most of you, all of you would agree with, that we should be striving for that excellence, but also intellectual and artistic excellence. That's, that's included in human excellence. Now, some music is bad enough that listening to it knowingly and willingly could be a mortal sin. A lot of heavy metal and hard rock, I would maintain, belongs to this category, as well as some of the truly nasty pop music on the radio. I don't, I'm not even gonna give examples, it's so nasty. I mean, I, I'm not saying I listen to it, I know that it exists though, <laughs> unfortunately. Other music, other music might not be evil in such an obvious way, but it could still be harmful by fostering moral imperfections, like that, that stirring up of anger and desire uh, in, in an excessive way that I was talking about before. Venial sin is bad, not only because of the offense in itself, light though it may be, but also because repeated venial sins pave a path to mortal sin. For instance, if we tell a lot of white lies about small things, it habituates us to telling lies about bigger things, right? I think everybody understands how that works. A steady diet of rock or pop or rap carries with it the serious risk of stunting one's moral growth, narrowing one's intellectual horizons, and impeding or clouding one's spiritual life. In a world of commercialized, relativistic, and ideological propaganda, we need to be very careful about the message we are taking in. But am I saying that popular music always has to be bad? That the only good music there is is that of a cultural elite? Are all of us supposed to become snobs? No, not at all. I mean, it wouldn't hurt to develop some cultural sophistication. After all, it's a perfection of our rational nature as made in the image and likeness of God. Yet, the point is not sophistication for its own sake, so that we can you know, hobnob successfully at a cocktail party. The point is to develop an ear for what is beautiful and what is fitting for every occasion with all the diversity that life occasions call for. When sitting around a campfire, one should sing folk songs. The, the preludes and fugues of Bach are not so appropriate for a campfire. At a square dance, one should have good old fashioned square dance music. At a wedding reception, one might showcase waltzes, swings, and country dances. This may sound crazy to people living in the mainstream, but I've been to many weddings where the selection of music at the reception is tasteful and where real dances are done by adventurous young people. I suspect it is somewhat like the traditional Latin mass. The young take to it readily, while some folks from the boomer generation frown at this strange departure from the Woodstock paradigm. Every normal human occasion has well-crafted music that suits it. Popular music does not have to be bad. The popular music of a healthy age, like the Catholic Middle Ages with its pilgrim songs and troubadour ballads, is beautiful through and through. All pop music from the Middle Ages was wonderful. Okay. Music to be good does not have to be boring or straight-laced or super refined and subtle. Medieval music displays immediacy, spontaneity, innocence. Its inventive melodies, harmonic ingenuity, and powerful rhythmic drive are compelling and captivating. And I, I could, I'm gonna give some examples of this music, not today, but, I'll, but I, I'll explain what I mean in a moment. Much the same could be said about genuine folk music. Think bluegrass or Celtic and Scottish music, which has experienced a tremendous revival in recent decades. So the, the, I just was gonna just mention a bunch of groups here. On the medieval side and the classical side, there's, there's this group called Hesperian 21. Uh, which is incredible, makes for incredible listening, very, very entertaining music, but also extremely beautiful music. Rolf Lilavan is another, I'll write these people down later. Um, you know, he's an, he's a, 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 he plays guitar and, and, uh, and lute and all sorts of other stringed instruments and just amazing mu music. And you've got in the, in the folk genre, 
um, you know, people like Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, the Chris Norman Ensemble, the Stillwater Hobos, the Hillbilly Thomas, who we were talking about that earlier today, um, the Tin Hat Trio, the Kingston Trio, I mean, both old and newer bands, there are so many of them. It's just like what I said about movies. There is so much good music out there that there's no reason to listen to what's inferior. Okay, let's say you're willing to explore the great music, but you don't know where to begin. It can seem overwhelming. Here's where modern technology, which has a lot of downsides, has unquestionably made it easier. On Spotify or any similar service, when you start with a popular piece like Vivaldi's Four Seasons, Handel's Water Music, Bach's Brandenburg Concertos, or Beethoven's Ninth Symphony, Spotify will make recommendations. Start with instrumental pieces and find what you like. You should be able to find something. It's not for nothing that certain pieces in the classical genre have been popular for centuries with every audience. You know, they, they, play works like, they play works by Tchaikovsky at these big summer free public concerts that thousands of people come to, you know? Listen to these pieces frequently until you get used to them. That's very important. Uh, familiarity, in this case, doesn't breed contempt, but the opposite, it breeds appreciation. Eventually, your tastes will catch up, your palate will develop, just like it does with fine foods, fine wine, and you will find a satisfaction beyond what you imagined possible. Um, I, in my own life, I can just say this. My experience of music was like, it was like this big. And as I started to listen to classical music, it just got bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And it's, inc I mean, like the, the, the magnitude of the musical art is just so much greater than most people realize. Right? So that's what I'm encouraging you to explore. This is a positive message. This is a message of expansion, not of contraction. Why is it so important to guard the entry to our soul? Our senses, especially our eyes and ears, are portals or gateways into our souls. What we watch, what we hear, gains entry into our minds and hearts. We cannot unsee what we have seen. We cannot unhear what we have heard. It becomes a part of us and shapes us. That's why we have to take these issues seriously. So um, I said a moment ago I would write these things down. What I mean is uh, I was talking to some, some of you earlier and, and we were talking about this question of like, okay, what, what are some good, what are, what are some recommendations, good music recommendations? And I said I would write a list. So I'm going to write a big list of all, kinds of all kinds of genres of music, and I'm going to give it to Augustine, and Augustine's going to give it to you. So if, and I hope that you follow up on some of it. All right, in the last part of my talk, I will turn to dating and Christian states of life. I better have a drink for this. <laughs> It's just water. I had enough wine this morning uh, with, with Augustine. He was, I think he was trying to get me ready for, to, for today. So. so there's a deep connection with all that I have said previously. The key question in life, in my opinion, is the following. Who are your friends? Who do you spend time with? There's an old saying, show me your friends and I'll tell you who you are. Our relationship of faith and love with Christ is what defines a Christian. Striving to deepen that relationship is the entire point of the moral life. And we should build up our other relationships around it and upon it as on a foundation of rock. All the negatives for which Christianity is so much uh, criticized, thou shalt not do this or thou shalt not do that, are for the purpose of removing obstacles or impediments to that friendship with Christ things that will distract or dilute or deform or even destroy it. The emphasis on purity of body and soul in Catholic morality can be easily misunderstood. It's not based on a puritanical fear of sex or sexuality, or at least it shouldn't be. Rather, being pure means having a single heart that can be given wholly to another. Purity means we are not torn apart and scattered, but have self-possession and integrity, so that we can say with proper pride, I am ready to give all of myself to you forever. We can say that, of course, only to God. I give all of myself to you forever. But we say something similar to a spouse in marriage. I am ready to give myself to you for life. Making this commitment presupposes having a unified, coherent self to give in the first place together with the power to give it, both of which are damaged by, for example, pornography, self-pleasuring, and promiscuity. As for dating, I am not going to give you elaborate advice. My advice is pretty straightforward. 
Marriage is a special kind of friendship. St. Thomas Aquinas says, quote, the greater the friendship, the more stable and lasting it is. Now between a man and his wife, there seems to be the greatest friendship, for they are made one, not only in the act of fleshly intercourse, which even among animals causes an agreeable fellowship, but also as partners in the whole of domestic life, unquote. We can glean two important points from this observation of St. Thomas. First, the act of becoming one flesh is and is meant to be, meant by God to be, an enormously powerful glue to bind together a man and a woman for life and for the purpose of their offspring who will be born from that union. However, this physical glue is not enough to keep two people together if they are not first and foremost committed to each other's personal good, which means the friendship each has with God and with each other in day-to-day -day human life. That is why it is crucial, crucial for the long-term prospects of a relationship success that it begin chastely and remain chaste throughout. Moving too quickly to physical intimacy has a way of blinding the partners to one another's character qualities, whether positive or negative, and builds the relationship on shifting sand, since feelings and emotions are inherently changeable things that come and go like sunshine and rain. Then maybe that's not a good example in California because it's always sunny. But in other parts of the world, it's, uh, weather is very changeable. To be rock solid, a relationship has to start with personality, character, virtue, the sharing of ideas and opinions and likes and dislikes, so that a rich and multifaceted friendship can be built up before the dizzying element of sexual intimacy is added to it. This is why it is essential, non-negotiable, that before dating, you have in your mind definite and clear boundaries that you will never transgress. To be worthy of dating, a man should be honorable. A man who is not willing to be honorable does not deserve a woman's time, effort, or affection. The same can be said of a woman worthy to date. Here is a simple but sufficient criterion. If a friendship or relationship is not helping you to become the person you should be in Christ, more virtuous, living with more integrity, it's time to end that relationship. Dating rightly, dating, dating rightly understood, aims at developing a personal friendship, which then has the potential, if God wills, and if it seems right to the couple, to culminate in the lifelong committed friendship of marriage. The circle of friends you hang out with is the likely pool of a future spouse. The least stressful and calmest approach is to get together with like-minded people more or less your age of both sexes, usually in larger groups than just you and one other person, at least initially. As these various friendships unfold, so do the possibilities of meeting someone who could be your future husband or wife. The key question is not, am I in love? Being in love is a subjective and fleeting phenomenon, sweet while it lasts, but incapable of serving as a compass and rudder. But rather, is this the kind of person with the virtues and commitments and beliefs with whom I could see myself spending my entire life? Remember St. Thomas's phrase, partners in the whole of domestic life. Would this man or woman make a good father or mother of our children? That may sound terribly pragmatic or utilitarian or calculating, but it's not at all if we can disentangle ourselves from the mythical romanticism that surrounds and almost suffocates us. The Hollywood portrait of a couple totally absorbed in each other, as if they had found ultimate bliss, is fake. Such feelings usually barely last the duration of a honeymoon. What is wonderful about marriage is not something as superficial as being in love. To love is to will the good of the other. This is what love really is. To love is to will the good of the other. Wanting what is best for the other person and working to make it happen. Marriage is wonderful because it provides for the stable, purposeful, self-giving love of a man and woman, equipped by the grace of God to succeed in building a meaningful and fruitful life together if they will lean on him. That is why marriage is worth infinitely more than the freedom of single life, more than a career, more than the autonomy we modern people value so much, indeed too much. What moderns have lost sight of the most, I believe, and this extends to many Catholics as well, is the beauty of the primary end of marriage, children. Marriage is a partnership for life in both senses. It is for always and it is fruitful for new life. God's love is never without fruit 
and any love that imitates him will not be without fruit either. So to think about marriage is to think about more than yourself or even your partner. It is to think about the gift of children God wishes to bring into the world and into the church through your love, your stable commitment, in which he will call forth all you have to give, and this will bring you to your full stature as he intended it. The child, an immortal soul created by God with a body fashioned of the parent's own flesh, the singular fruit of their mutual love and of his eternal love, destined for heaven through baptism and a life of faith. This child is the reason God brings a Christian man and woman together. It is not the only reason he brings them together, of course, but without it, marriage would not exist at all. And nothing, nothing in the whole of creation can compare with the value and worth of a single child, a son of man, a son of God. One human person is more valuable than the entire universe of non-human creatures. Every bit of land, sea, sky, and space, all the animals and plants, all of it. So take that, you environmentalists. <laughs> and yet so many people live as if just about anything else takes precedence over the fruit of the womb. The person into whom God has breathed the breath of life, into whom he breathes eternal life by the sacraments. If we fully understood this mystery, we would die for sheer wonder. And if we understand it just a little, we will never make the mistake of devaluing marriage or denigrating its primary end. Satan does what he can to thwart God's plan, and so he does with each of us if we let him. The devil opposes natural as well as supernatural generation. He seeks to prevent men and women from using the gift of their sexuality to bring more life into the world. He seeks to prevail upon them to kill the fruit they bear. He seeks to lead them away from the source of immortality in the sacraments of the church. Hating procreation, the devil has bent all his efforts toward either preventing it through contraception or destroying its th fruits through abortion. Contraception is an abomination of desolation in the midst of the temple, which is the human body sanctified by the Holy Spirit. That's the holy temple. Through contraception, the Lord and giver of life is cast out of the temple as if he were an evil spirit, and in his place is welcomed the spirit of lust and avarice to make its home in the barren womb, like a church with no tabernacle and no real presence. When a Christian man and woman marry in the Lord, that is, when they embrace their calling to the full, embracing each other and the children God gives them, they do the greatest and noblest thing on earth from the vantage of the capacities God has planted in human nature itself. The marriage is elevated by Christ the bridegroom into a living sign of his unbreakable union of love with his immaculate bride, the church. In this way, Christian spouses show forth to each other and to the world the central mystery of reality, the love that moves the sun and the stars, the love that multiplies itself in the joy of giving, the love that overcomes self-isolation. To complete this picture, we must consider the calling to the priesthood and the calling to the religious life, because it is only when we look at all of them together that we understand the surpassing beauty of each one. By the priesthood, a man is lifted up into Christ's own work of priestly mediation and sacrifice. He has made a conduit of grace for the church and for the world, a privileged friend of the divine bridegroom, a worker of miracles, as day by day he turns bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, gives divine life to infants, restores divine life to sinners, carves off pieces of Satan's empire by the power of his blessing, sends beloved souls to heaven with extreme unction. Once again, it seems to me that if men understood what this vocation was, the world would not have seminaries enough to house the candidates who would rush to fill them. Religious life, that is, the life constituted by the evangelical vows of poverty for the kingdom of God, chastity in the sense of the voluntary sacrifice of sexual activity and the goods that originate from it, and obedience as a sacrifice of self-determination in the world, is in some ways an even more exalted vocation than the priesthood. For in religious life, a man or woman lives out the vows of baptism as perfectly as possible, consecrating the totality of his or her life to God. Imitating most fully the God-man Jesus Christ, who lived his life on earth entirely and exclusively for the glory of the Father and for the salvation of souls, the monk, friar, nun, or sister no longer lives as befits life in the present age, 
acquiring and possessing private property, bringing children into the world by marital union, retaining freedom about where they will live, what their job will be, etc. Instead, the religious place themselves completely at God's disposal to be his alone and to do his work alone. They are the holocausts, the whole burnt offerings. Their way of life is the royal road that leads more swiftly to the perfection of charity and wins the most abundant graces for the world. As the heart is the hidden spring of life in the body, so are contemplatives, in particular, the hidden heart of the church on whom all the rest of us rely. And one last time, I cannot help saying, as I did about marriage and priesthood, that if only our eyes and ears were wide open, if we were living in the element of supernatural faith as fish swim in water, the Catholic world would once again look like medieval Europe, covered from end to end with countless convents, monasteries, and priories, resounding with the chanted praises of God and resplendent for their charity to the poor and their hospitality to all. That's why the welfare state wasn't necessary in the Middle Ages. Any Christian state of life or calling, any Christian state of life, is a God-given path to maturity, fullness, fruitfulness, holiness, and glory. We will not get these things by staying single. This is why, at the right time and in the right way, we should discern either marriage, religious life, or priesthood. These are the states of life. Singleness is a state of suspension, a waiting platform, a transitional phase until we find the place where God asks us to put down our roots. It's true that some people remain single for life, and that is not in itself morally wrong, but there's no calling to it. No one has a vocation to singleness. There are only three states of life to which God calls Christians, marriage, religious life, and priesthood. Marriage is a natural calling, that is, a call from God as the author of human nature, which he created male and female for the union of marriage and for bringing new life into the world and into the church. Religious life and priesthood are supernatural callings, that is, Christ calling someone out of what is natural to man or woman into a total communion, sorry, a total commitment to him and his kingdom. What will your role be in the reconquest of the world for Jesus Christ? in the spread of his kingdom, in the embrace of his life-giving cross. That is a matter for you and God to work out, and he will not fail to lead you if you are generous with him. Be of good cheer, be confident, for he has overcome the world, and you, by his gracious favor, are already sharing in his victory. To him be the glory, now and forever. Amen. Thank you very much for your attention. I imagine that that, that probably um, uh, stirred up one or two questions somewhere in, in, out there. <laughs> <laughs> in other in other words, don't be too silent. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, it would be obviously a false conclusion. It would be a false inference to say that because Joseph doesn't have words recorded in Scripture, therefore he never talked to Mary. Um, I think I think that, that the lesson we're supposed to get more is that he wasn't talkative. He wasn't. Um, he was a man of of action more than a man of talk. Uh, and I mean, and of course, Our Lady doesn't have much. I mean, she her she has seven or eight phrases recorded in Scripture that she said. Um, so you know, she she's only a little bit past Saint Joseph in that respect. Uh, you know, but um, I think what, what what I mentioned also is that Saint Joseph is a model of justice, and that justice is to give to the other what you owe him. 
And what, what, what spouses owe to each other is communication. I mean, that's one of the things they owe to each other. Uh, and and men, men do have a reputation for being rather bad at communication. Um, and uh, as my wife reminds me sometimes, uh, I can't, I, she, as she likes to remind me, I don't know what you're thinking. I can't, I can't, you know, I can't read behind there. So you have to open up and say what you're thinking about this or that. Um, so, yeah. Thank you there. Uh, I was hoping to get your, uh, to get, get your thoughts on, uh, on a subject I've been thinking about kind of by way of uh, commenting on mm -hmm. something that's been, that, that just recently came into the Catholic news. Yeah. Uh, so it, it recently uh, came out that, um, you know, the program, the new program of priestly formation, um, or it sounds like diocesan um, seminaries uh, was recently approved by Rome. And in it, there seems to be widespread adoption of what would be the propitious year, the year of spirituality, the first year at the beginning of seminary, to essentially prepare men to learn how to pray um, and in a way to respond to the fact that priests nowadays are entering more into missionary territory than I guess going to into a state prison. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the question is, um, I guess, that seems to be a well thought, or at least a thoroughly thought out and uh, kind of definitive model for priestly formation. Mm -hmm. But I, I think maybe I'm saying this here, maybe I'm open to correction, but there doesn't seem to be something at quite as well defined for a discernment of the marital vocation. So mm -hmm. I guess my question is, um, do you think one that this is a good or a good way of kind of transposing that propagandic mm -hmm. concept onto the discernment of married life, um, or would you kind of mm -hmm. propose something else, something different, in, in kind of preparation? So you're you're saying that 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 for the priesthood, there's a well-defined year of discernment. Yes. Um, it, yeah. Would it be helpful to transpose something like that to married life? Or well, the, the, the thing is that, that um, you know, as I've reflected on these things, it seems to me that there's just, there's such a radical difference between priesthood and religious life on the one hand and marriage on the other in this simple, very simple fact. I mean, I'm just going to say something that's as baldly obvious as possible, just that entering the religious life or entering a seminary is an individual decision. You're the only one who has to discern that. Uh, and, and you can, and in fact, St. Thomas Aquinas is really clear about this. Um, this is a whole separate question that I, I'll just comment on briefly because I think it's important. There are two different ways of thinking about vocational discernment in the, in the Western tradition. There's the Thomistic way and there's the Ignatian way. And the, the, the Thomistic way is, 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 to make it simple, is very objective and the Ignatian way is very subjective. So the, the, the uh, St. Thomas asks, is priesthood or religious life a good thing? Is it even a superior thing? Do I have a desire for it? If yes, then do it. Don't ask, is God calling me? And, and sort of tie yourself into pretzels over that. But just say, this is good. I desire it. I'm going to do it, period. Then God gives you the grace to do it. That's Thomas's view. The Ignatian view is much more like, am I suited to this? Is this going to, you know, is this going to be the way that I can serve God best? How do I find out from God if this is what he wants me personally to do? And there's truth to both of these approaches. But I, I tend to think that moderns have become very subjectivistic in general. And we tend to, like, there's this problem of, you've probably heard this joke about, like, the, the order of perpetual discerners, you know? Like, in other words, it, it can be very difficult for modern people to make decisions, to make life decisions. Um, and I think part of that is just, is a cultural phenomenon. We are just simply not thrust at a young age. Like, in every former century, people were thrust to making life decisions very early on. Like by the time you were 14, 15, 16, you kind of knew what you were going to be doing in life. And either you were going to be doing the same thing your family did, or, or you, know, you didn't have a choice about it, or, or you were old enough and mature enough because life was f so free of distractions that by the time you were 16, you could say, okay, I want to become a Benedictine monk, and then you did, right? Um, in modern times, it's actually, in, in, a, in a sort of paradoxical way, Life is so easy for us in some respects that we can postpone certain decisions for a long time and we can kind of coast and cruise for a while and actually have a pretty successful and life and we can have lots of good friends and lots of good times and never actually find like and postpone the state of life question, right? So then getting back to marriage, 
it seems to me that um, it's a good idea for, I would say, for every Catholic young man and woman, they, everyone should make some kind of vocational discernment, retreat, either, either go to a place that they already love or that they think they might love or go on a retreat if it's offered by reputable people. You know, you can't just pick it at random. It has to be like offered by the right people, uh, by the right community. I mean, you understand what I mean. Like the Fraternity of St. Peter has good vocational retreats and stuff. Um, you know, everybody should do that to, to think about it and pray about it. But as far as, you know, as far as marriage is concerned, it really just, it has more to do with meeting the right person. And when the two of you develop a relationship to the point where you can both say, you know, yes, we think this could work, you know, like we're going to take it more seriously and you just take it step by step. So in other words, the, the discernment of marriage is kind of in, in the relationship itself is where that happens. It's not something you can do like a year as, apart <laughs> to discern that, right? Um, and that's, that's connected with my claim here that marriage is a natural calling. So that is to say, it's a sacramental state of life. It's a Christian state of life. It's blessed by God with, with supernatural grace. But in and of itself, it's a natural relationship. That is, all of us are called by nature to marriage. Even priests and religious are called to marriage. They've just sublated, sublimated that into a different calling. Um, John Paul II was actually really good about saying that even the priesthood and the religious life, they need to be understood in nuptial terms, in spousal terms. That's, that's a very important insight, and it's one that goes all the way back into the tradition. The Middle Ages talks about that as well. So, um, so my, my point is that no one really needs to discern marriage in a certain sense. We're all called to marriage by nature. There's no discernment there. The question is, fi is, is finding the spouse, right? Not finding, you know what I mean? Like, it's like, uh, we don't have to find that marriage is a good thing. It's just a good thing. So it's, it's more about the, the relationship then. So, yes? Uh, do you think Christians should use like entertainment services like you know, uh, Netflix, Amazon Prime, mm. now like Disney? Because you know like, a lot of the companies, like, there's, there's a lot of evil stuff on it, yes. but there's also a lot of like, some good, wholesome stuff. So like, the balance between you know, the shows and the services, and now they're like, more in your face. Like, yes. We have an agenda. We're coming for your kids. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we're, we're, they're coming for the adults too. So like, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah. And it's like kind of like a form of brainwashing. So like, what's your approach on finding the balance in that? Like, like you're giving your money to these industries, and also yeah. like, with investing, like it's like you know, like you put it in like an index fund. You're, you're putting your money. Yeah, it's it's the, yeah. This is a terribly difficult question right now. Um, so the the easier question I think is the investments question because because uh, I say it's easier because there are there are I, I have investments in the Knights of Columbus funds and the Knights of Columbus funds compete very successfully against all the other ones. And at least I know that they're not investing in the worst things. I, I'm sure I wouldn't agree with everything they're investing in, you know. Uh, but but I know that they're not investing in abortion or contraception or I, I, there are things that are like the really like the red flags I know are not a problem there. I used to use Ave Maria investments, but I, before I switched over to Knights of Columbus, and they're also quite competitive in the market. So basically, Catholics it, now if they want to do their own investing, it's even easier because they can just choose which companies they're going to invest in. I, I guess the, the the same question comes up with like, can you buy stocks in Apple Computer? You know, like this massively pro LGBT company, right? Should we buy stocks in that company? And you know, I've just I've I've known very good Catholics, very serious traditional Catholics who come down on opposite sides on that question. Like some of them say, look, Apple is a company. I'm not in charge of their company. I'm not in charge of their of their policies. They build good computers. They're building a product that's useful to people. It can be used for good or evil. That's up, that's up to the free will of those who are using it. And I'm just investing in this company as a technology company, and that's all I'm doing. And then other people say, no, you can't separate the company's policy and its politics and so on from what it's producing. So you shouldn't invest in that. Um, and I don't have like the I don't have the perfect answer to that question. Um, as far as something like I think it's similar with Amazon. I mean, for example, okay, I'm an author, and all of my books are available on Amazon. And some of my books are available only on Amazon, okay? Um, so, I mean, I'm not, like, it, I would be a huge hypocrite if I was up here saying, like, no, you should never buy from Amazon or invest in Amazon or something. If it, that's, so I think we're, we're John Paul II, um, 
invented this, this expression, uh, structures of sin. Maybe you've heard this expression before. He talks about it in, in his um, document called Reconciliatio et Penitentia. Uh, and he didn't, in, I mean, he, he invented the phrase, the concept of it goes all the way back to the church fathers, the idea of corporate sin. But in the sense of like companies are so huge right now that most companies are doing something immoral somewhere. Like, you know, most big corporations, and especially in the media world. Um, I mean, heck, even supporting Mel Gibson is not, you know, a perfectly obvious moral choice. You know, he's kind of he's iffy, if you ask me. Uh, so I, I'm just not sure if, you know, like the modern capitalist market is not offering many, like, perfectly scot-free, perfectly, you know, unobjectionable options. And what we have to, what we have to ask is, like, so we have to ask questions like, are there alternatives that are going to work equally well or at least nearly equally well that I can use? And am I just being lazy by not using them? Something like that where you could, like if there were, I, I don't know if there's a Christian Netflix kind of a thing, but if there, if there were, or, and, so, and if there isn't, somebody ought to create that because I'm sure it would do extremely well. I mean, just think about the millions of Christians in America who would use something like that. It's, it's, I, as far as I'm concerned, that's a no-brainer that that should exist. Um, you know, and they had like basic Ten Commandments policies, like we're not going, then, then of course we should get our movies from them. I mean, that's, that's why I sort of say like, as cl when there are clear options and a, and a better option, go with that. When there isn't, you know, then you have to weigh this, the question of like proximate versus remote participation, right? Which would mean like, when I buy a product from Amazon, it doesn't mean I endorse every product Amazon sells. I and mean, that'd be absurd. They sell like 5 billion pro products. I mean, that's, you know, but if, if I, um, I don't know, like if I buy shares in Pfizer or like one of these pharmaceutical companies, that seems like a, like a bigger deal than just buying a product from Amazon or buying a Pfizer product at the local drugstore, right? These are, these are different kinds of decisions. So, yeah. But thanks for that question. That's a good, good ethical question. Yes. Well, um, I guess the, the practical, the initial practical question in response would be, what does it mean to be guided by theology of the body? I mean, that is, what, what is there uh, in, in it which would have a practical function in, um, let's say, dating and finding a spouse and getting married? It, it seems to me, in other words, that one could do all of those things successfully as people have done for thousands of years without theology of the body. So in, on a practical level, I wouldn't see any need to focus particular attention on it. Um, on the other hand, I, I do disagree with some of my fellow traditionalists who, like, they think that all oh, theology of the body is all heretical. You know, they have all these reactions to it, and I definitely don't agree with that. I think that it's actually. I mean, I think, I think the problem is that there have been some popularizers of it. Um, I'm not going to name any names, but there have been some popularizers who've who've tried to to sort of. Um, Take John Paul II's theology of the body, which is fairly sophisticated, you know, in terms of its philosophy and theology, and they've tried to to um, distill it into like little pamphlets and booklets and things, you know, and make it. They sort of jazz it up and make it all exciting and stuff. And I just think eh, it starts to become sort of tasteless at a certain point. Um, it seems like it seems like one should, if one is going to study um, the philosophy and theology of marriage and family and human sexuality and, and anthropology, all these things are important subjects. One should study it seriously and not try to get like the, like the Kool-Aid, you know, the, the popular version of it. That's, that's typically going to, to be superficial and, and maybe tilted in a way that is, it's too tilted towards trying to appeal to modern secular people. And like, and you know, kind of like, you can be cool and Catholic at the same time. Well, there's a sense in which that's true and there's a sense in which that's not true. Especially if, if people have a distorted view of what coolness means, then it's not true, right? Um, if it means like being like Pier Giorgio Frassati, I mean, he was cool, right? Everybody get like, look at the guy, right? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, he's like going out there with these like anti-fascist clubs and like 
you know, I mean, he was great. When you read about the life, if you haven't read the life of Pier Giorgio Frassati, he was incredible. And he's, he's like, uh, you know, he's like the most virile saint you can imagine. And very funny and daring and, you know, just an awesome person. Um, but, you know, so he's cool in a Catholic way, right? Um, not in a secularist way, right? So that's, I hope that's something of an answer to that question. Yes. Uh, so you mentioned dancing and music earlier. So I, I've been plugged into the traditional science Catholicism for about five years now. And I remember the, an interesting thing I've noticed is a real deep traditional Sicilian. No dancing at all. Like you mentioned, like square dancing and stuff like that. You know, the big parts are called like St. John. Yes, <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Or even like St. Charles Borromeo when he was bishop of his diocese. And, you know, the, the penance. Like, like, um, right, just flat out all dancing yeah. in the world. Yeah, so, 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 dances like the tango are obviously there's some, there are some issues there. Yeah, I mean, but here in California, you know, not too long ago, there were priests, uh, who were Mexican priests who even thought like the waltz was immodest because mm. people were too close to each other. Yeah, so, okay, this is a very interesting question to my mind. Um, first of all, and most basically, St. John Vianney or St. Charles Borromeo is not the same thing as the Catholic Magisterium. I mean, they have their opinions, and we shouldn't just laugh them off and say, oh, there's nothing to that. That would be foolish. But to, to quote them as if they were like the gospel according to St. John Vianney, I mean, like, no, they don't have that authority over us. Um, it's an opinion. It's an opinion that is as weighty as any one holy person's opinion is weighty. And there are lots of holy people, not just St. John Vianney. Um, so I think, I think that's one point to bring up. Um, another point to bring up is that, you know, there are, in fact, different, like, there are lots of different situations and circumstances in church history that we're dealing with. And culture, culture does change for the better and for the worse in various ways at various times. And I would, I would imagine from what I, what I can tell about St. So St. John Chrysostom, I'll give his, the example of him. St. John Chrysostom also thunders against people dancing at weddings. He has this huge homily where he's just ripping into people about this. Well, if you, if you study the history more, the dancing, the, the dancing that was done in John Chrysostom's era was very pagan and very lascivious and very, it was the only kind of dancing that, that would have been done was what the pagans had learned how to do. There wasn't like Christian dancing yet, you know, nobody had invented this concept. Um, so he was railing against it because they were basically taking pagan customs and bringing them into, into Catholic weddings. And I think that's, that kind of thing still happens today. I mean, I, I find it, frankly, really disturbing. In fact, I won't go to wedding receptions anymore if they're just going to be like blasting the most secular music to the point where it just shatters your eardrums. And like, you've just been to this beautiful wedding mass, and then you're going to this like Lupercalian, Bacchanalian, like just obnoxious thing. You know, it, it, to me, it's so discordant. Um, so I think that we still need to be di very discerning about that. And we need to ask, like, what, how would, how can we have fun in a way that's like really Christian, really modest, and really, um, I think it's possible. I mean, it just takes more imagination and, and a little more effort, a little more thoughtfulness that, that can go into it. And I think probably most of you have been to, you know, real dances, by which I mean where people are not just like gyrating around, but like they're actually, <laughs> they're actually just, but, but they're, they're actually like doing couple dances or group dances, which actually, I know this from experience because I saw this a lot at TAC and then at Wyoming Catholic College where we do a lot of those sorts of things. Those dances are actually way more fun. I mean, once you get into it, once the kids know what they're doing with the line dances, with the folk dances, with the waltz and the swing and those things, they're just, they're actually just inherently better. They're superior forms of, of entertainment and of exercise. Um, and, and so you don't miss it once you actually take that step. You don't miss the old, like formless, chaotic, bacchanalian sort of thing. Um, so, you asked about, um, oh, like, yeah. So, so one of the ways in which I think culture has shifted somewhat is that it seems to me in the former centuries that people had, people had super strict notions of not only of, of modesty, but also of contact between men and women. And 
our culture has gone way to the opposite extreme. It's like a pendulum swing. So we've gone from like being over here where you're not even supposed to like look at the opposite sex, let alone touch them, to like, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna say, try to say what our extreme is, but our extreme is very extreme. Um, and so it seems to me that really there would be a virtue in trying to find the right mean between those two things. And it's, I, I think that probably in St. John Vianney's day, the rules were so strict that if the boys and girls got to the dances, then bad things started to happen because it was finally like, oh, we have an opportunity to be together. Because the, whole, the society in general was rather repressive and rather standoffish. And, that, and as we all know, that kind of thing can backfire, and can lead to other problems. Um, but I, I think that if you take like, healthy, well-balanced Catholics today, and you let them do swings and waltzes, it's not gonna be this like simmering pot of lust. You know, I, I can't, I don't really, I, I mean like, I don't see that as really an issue. I haven't seen that as an issue. It just doesn't seem to be one. So I don't, you know, I, I understand why maybe when waltzing first started, it was like, ooh, this is really racy, you know, cause they're touching each other and whatever. But that was in a society where nobody did that at all, right? And now I think, you know, I think about like, all the youth groups I've been in, uh, that I was in, and, and all the interactions I've seen where like all the college students, they just go hugging each other and they're so happy to see each other. And there just isn't this same sense of like contact is like forbidden, you know? So that's why, why I think we, have a, we can have a different attitude about swings and waltzes. But we should still have, like we should still have a problem with the tango because that's just an extremely sensuous dance. Like it's meant to be sexually explicit in some ways and or sexually arousing and it seems to me that that's that's a bad thing like you know you could still draw lines even having said that we're more relaxed now we shouldn't be too relaxed right there's a there's a point at that so whenever you talk about questions like this and and also the question of modesty as well it's always a question of there are there seem to be objective principles but they always have to be put into practice prudentially you have to make prudential judgments and those and prudential judgments by definition are not subject to an exact mathematical rule, right? Um, all you can say is something like this seems to be appropriate, right? And then people can have disagreements with each other and they will have disagreements with each other. Um, the only time that people don't have disagreements is when you have a really strong culture, a unified culture, which we don't have anymore. I mean, the modern world is not, doesn't have a culture. It's a multi, I hate to use this overused expression, but it's multicultural. It's, 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 well, it's anti-cultural in some ways, but I just mean everything nowadays is sort of lowest common denominator individualism. And so we don't have like high cultural norms that everybody feels obliged to live up to. Whereas a hundred years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, um, actually not a hundred years ago because the 1920s were pretty racy, but, but before the 1920s uh, and, and into former centuries, there was a very definite code. Like this is how people dressed. This is how people acted. This is how people interacted. And like, you just didn't break, you just didn't go against that if you wanted to be considered a respectable person, right? Um, and you know, I think most, uh, most of us would agree that that actually, like, there's something good about that because it takes a lot of pressure off of the individual. Like, I don't have to invent the social rules. I don't have to figure out what's modest or immodest. I just do what everybody else is doing, right? Um, so that it, it kind of makes it easier on the individual. But anyway, that's, that's the way things are. So we just have to accept that. Yeah. Okay. So I knew somebody was going to bring up this question. <laughs> That's great. Well, uh, as as um, Augustine said in his introduction, I, I don't hesitate to say controversial things. So I don't know if this will be controversial in this group, but I I, I don't. Um, I don't buy the idea of consecrated single life as such. I mean, it doesn't seem to me to have any place in the Christian tradition. There are consecrated virgins. That's always been the case. And if what you mean, like if, if, you, if, if, the, if a woman believes that she's called to be a consecrated virgin, but not in a religious community, I mean, first of all, that's a bit odd. I mean, in terms of the tradition of the church, most of the time, nearly all the time, it would have been said, well, you should find a community to be a part of because as St. Benedict says in his rule, it's easier to become holy in a community than it is to do it by yourself. The vocation to holiness by oneself is the most difficult vocation. That's the hermit's vocation, right? Um, and it's even harder if you're gonna to try to be a hermit, like a, a consecrated virgin in the middle, in the midst of the world. I mean, what are, what are they doing, you know? It doesn't really make sense, you know? Um, 
if you're going to be in the world, you should be in the world, but not of the world, you know? And if you're going to be consecrated to the Lord, you should step out of the world into a community of people who are doing that together and supporting each other um, in that endeavor. So um, I guess with, with Opus Dei, um, you know, the, the numeraries, I've known some of them, uh, very good people. I mean, they are living together, so they have some kind of community. Uh, some, they have a fraternal, fraternal relationship with each other, and they are supporting each other and praying with and for each other. So it's kind of like, it's kind of like a religious order, but not really. You know what I mean? So that, that is, canonically speaking, it's not a religious order, but de facto, they're living as if they're plain clothes religious. Um, and you know, it's anomalous. Um, I don't know, like, does that make it wrong? I, you know, is it impossible for the Lord to raise up a new form of Christian life like that? Well, I mean, how dare I say that, you know, that like, you, you can't do that. It just seems odd, it is odd, it's anomalous against the backdrop of the way that religious life has developed um, in the West. And I think it developed that way for good reasons. So, so that's my kind of non-answer answer. I hope that was, <laughs> that was all right, so. I, I try to be honest when I don't when I don't have like a, a full a answer about something. So I don't really know f fully what to say about Opus Dei, except that it seems anomalous. That's what I'm going to say. So, yeah. I you you mentioned um, back here in your section on breathing that there was a there's a uh, could you speak more about the 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 concept of romanticism or romanticization? Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, like, and the relationship between the two? Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I'll, I'll just say, uh, to be honest, that I was probably a bit hard on, in my talk on the notion of being in love. So I'm not, I'm, not trying to, I'm not trying to say that it's a bad thing for a man and woman to fall in love. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. What I'm saying is that I'm saying two things. One is that it's... Um, it's dangerous to let the state, so be, being in love or falling in love is a heavily emotional state to be in. And emotions are good, but they need to be subordinate to reason and to free will. And they, and, and they have to be subordinate to the long view, whereas feelings kind of by definition are about the short view. They're about right now and not the long view, like five years, 10 years, 20 years, 50 years, right? So without killing feelings, we also don't want to be submerged in them and completely dominated by them and driven by them, right? Because that leads to bad decisions, or at least sometimes it leads to very regrettable decisions. Um, the other thing that I, that I want to say about that is that it's not necessary to be in love or to have fallen in love in order to have a happy and healthy marriage. And that's the thing that's harder for modern people to grasp. Like we, we think, how, like is it really possible for a man and a woman who are friends and who, re, who like each other as people just to say one day, let's get married, you know, like, you know, not have this like magical, like glimmering, you know, you know going between them, right? Um, and, it, and it seems to me that that just happened everywhere. That was like the main way, most people got married that way for most of human history. That is not having this tempestuous involvement with each other, but just seeing, sort of clearly that this is a good partner and this is like somebody that I could live with. And, you know, and, um, and, and, in, and in fact, the extreme example of that are societies with arranged marriages, right? Where, where nothing is based on, I mean, it's not, it's not, it probably, yeah, I'll give you an example. I knew this couple from India uh, who were students of mine in Austria, because um, I was teaching at an international school, had people from all over the world. And this couple, um, they, they had grown up in two families that were neighbors. These families were neighbors. And these two, the, this, this man and woman, had known each other from the time they were infants. Okay, they played together. You know, they played Legos together, whatever they do in India. I'm not sure if they probably have Legos. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but um, you know, some other brand. Uh, and, and they just, and, and they knew each other all through high school. And there was never anything romantic between them. But they were very good friends. And their parent, for their parents, it was a no-brainer that they were going to arrange this marriage for them uh, because that's still done a lot in India to, to this very day. And the two of them were quite content. I mean, it, it, they were very obedient to their parents. And they said, well, if you, 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 basically their attitude was, mom and dad, you know us better than we know ourselves. 
and you know that we've known each other for all these years, and so if you think we should get married, then we'll get married. And they did, and they were very happy together. I mean, I have to say, they, say, they seem like a great couple, you know? Um, so I think sometimes we need to sort of retool our understanding and, and, and be more personalistic about marriage and less emotion-driven about it. And I do, I, anyway, I hope that helps to say that. Yeah, so I guess from my own side is that um, it just seems that in modern society, I think even among practicing Catholics who desire to be married, it's a, uh, almost a substitution of this romanticism from, from what I can see, a some mm -hmm. sort of romanticism for marriage, and often mm -hmm. people don't get to the cross. They don't, they don't even like real, realize it, like they don't like parse it out in their mm -hmm. mind. Like, like, you're, like I, I guess it's just inside of what you're saying, right? You have that this other indie couple who are, who are very good friends, and they were personalistically, they, in a certain sense, they sought marriage with the aid of their, their society, right? Yeah. Their parents. Yes. But um, it wasn't any sort of romance that came out of that was subordinate, and it was sort of at, at an out, outpouring of them yes. both in a certain sense. Well, seeking, seeking exactly. And, and just given, given, given the way human beings are built, you know, the, the, the relationship of, of that couple, the Indian couple that I knew, they seemed genuinely affectionate towards each other. In other words, it wasn't just a relationship of utility. Yeah. They, 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 they grew to love each other in a way that was emotional, um, but it began more with a rational decision. That's kind of what I'm getting at, is that it doesn't always have to, I think what ha often happens in the West, in the modern West, is that people fall in love, and then after a certain time they say, we should think about getting married, right? But it's also possible to start with, we should think about get, getting married, and then to fall in love later. <laughs> I mean, in a certain sense, right? to let the emotions kind of follow. That, can, that certainly does happen, um, and I've seen it happen. So anyway, at least it's, it's something to think about. Yeah. Yes? Uh, going back to, to liturgy, like the first part of your talk, um, what would you say to, so for instance, like in the West, Thinking mainly about uh, Latin tradition, or maybe there's Jesus Ordo, there's uh, liturgical Latin Mass, and then on the East you have you know, Byzantine Rite, Alphabet Rite, um, etc. What would you say to someone um, that is, well, some, some uh, even like myself, sometimes I would be like, well, you know, I really like the beauty of the Byzantine Rite, but I also like the TLM, but oh no, so and so group is going to the Novus Ordo, and they're just kind of like, I'm, I'm not really in any particular tradition, mm -hmm. but kind of taking bits and pieces here and there. I've heard on the one hand that, well, that's kind of enriching because you're getting a little bit from the East, a little bit from the West, and you're kind of putting mm -hmm. it together and you're enriching yourself. But then I hear on the other side, well, you're you're not focusing in on any particular right, so you're not mm -hmm. informed. What, mm -hmm. what, what would you say? Yeah, that? no, I, I think I think that it's it's uh, basically a liturgical tradition is a school. It's a school that has a curriculum, if I can put it that way, and the curriculum is consists of the cycle of the of the liturgical year, all the texts, the propers of the liturgy, the music of it, the ceremonial of it, the vestments of it. Um, all of those things, all of them together form an annual curriculum through which Christians are supposed to pass. And, 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 but it's different from a school curriculum in the sense that when we finish, you know, I don't know, uh, something like algebra, we're done with it probably. We're not, probably not going to go back to that. But with the liturgy of the church, because it's dealing with, with the, the eternal and infinite mysteries of God, we keep going through it year after year. And that's because e each year we we're going to learn something new. As we go grow older and we have more experience, and as, and, and, and as God himself gives us more grace, we will learn more and more and more. So that's basically how I see the liturgy. It's enrolling in a school, in a sense, right? I mean, I, if you have a positive view of school, you can use that metaphor. If you don't like school, then you have to think of a different metaphor <laughs> that's gonna you know, make it sound more appealing to you. Um, but since I'm a pro I, I was a professor, that's kind of the metaphor that, that I think of. So um, it would be really strange, like if you were enrolled in a program, to just like drop it and go and visit some other school and take some courses randomly and then come back and then do another one. I mean, like it would be, it would give you intellectual indigestion. You know, you wouldn't get what you're supposed to get from that school of spirituality. So I, I, I would say, to put it as simple as, po as simply as possible, that it's okay to be an, a liturgical pilgrim from time to time and make a pilgrimage, so to speak, to visit someone else's liturgical rite and to, to 
experience the richness of that and to, and to give you a better sense of the Catholicity of the church, but not to be a liturgical nomad, right? So a pilgrim is one thing and a nomad is another. A nomad is somebody who moves around and has no home. A pilgrim is somebody who has a home but occasionally goes away from it for a, for a spiritual reason, you know? And I think that, you know, I, and obviously in my, in my life, it was hugely beneficial to me. I was in a situation where in Austria, where we had, the only way I could get to the traditional Latin mass, which is my, my passion, was to drive on Sundays quite a distance. We either had to drive an hour in one distance, like it was, an, you know, it was an hour in one direction or an hour and a half in another direction to get to Latin mass. Um, and so we did that on Sundays, but on weekdays, what we had was the Byzantine Divine Liturgy um, celebrated by Ukrainian Greek Catholics. Well, mostly Ukrainian Greek Catholics. There were some Romanians and some Slovakians as well but anyway, so they kind of took turns. And, and as, because we wanted to go to, to liturgy daily, we just went to Byzantine liturgy during the week. So that was a kind of circumstantial reason to go. It wasn't that I was choosing to, to go to that versus the other. Um, but I, but I, I really benefited from that hugely. And I learned so much about my faith and about the liturgy from that experience uh, that has, if, if, any of you, if any of you ever read uh, any of my books, you'll see I frequently talk about the, the Greek or the Byzantine tradition because, uh, of, of, because I find that it illuminates the Western tradition. They both illuminate each other, actually. The, the differences between them help to disclose the underlying continuities. Uh, and, and also, I mean, uh, not, not, not that I want to dwell on this, but they also expose, when you compare the traditional rites of East and West, they expose the big flaws of the Novus Ordo. If the Novus Ordo doesn't pass the smell test, you know, of, of, of all, if you look at all the traditional liturgies and then you look at it, they're, they're built on different lines. Um, and so that's, that was also something that was kind of a light that went off in my head you know, through that. So. Yes? Uh, how long do you think a guy and a girl should be friends before before what particularly like like uh, like proposing or talking about marriage or what exactly uh, before you started, like, dating. oh I see how long to be friends yeah. before having yeah well I, I guess part of the difficulty of even talking about dating is that there are different definitions of what it means um, and I'm not even sure if I know all of the different possible meanings it has, but I guess it, it seems like it seems like the basic idea is, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, maybe this is not how people speak anymore, but it, like dating basically means going steady. Like it's a couple. One, you know, we're just going to see each other and we're going to do things together as a couple and not in a group anymore. And, and so there's a kind of like implicit commitment that, that we're going to try this for a while and see where it goes. Um, as opposed to just like casual meetings, like you could, like a boy could meet a girl for a cup of coffee and it's not a date necessarily, and it's not, or it doesn't have to be. And, and, and certainly by going out for coffee, they're not dating. So that's how I see it, is as like a more of a long-term exclusive and a more serious um, uh, relationship. That's, that would be dating. So, uh, yeah. I mean, I think part of, the, part of the problem with answering that question is that, you know, I've, I, I've known some couples who like, like the guy, the guy and the girl met, and they instantly like hit it off with each other, and they started dating, and they were married within like six months. I mean, I've, I've known situations like that. that's pretty rare, but it happens. And then I've also known situations where people have been friends for a really long time, and everybody else around them knew that they were going to get married, and they were like, oh, no. they're just kind of like in space, you know, about it. Uh, and so I, I think it just, it's really hard, like there's no timeline that, that you could really set up because people's temperaments and personalities and relationships can be so different. And, and so like m human beings are so complex that things happen in different ways. But generally speaking, I mean, it seems to me that, that it's, it's probably a good idea to just know somebody for like maybe half a year or a year, um, you know, before you, and, and to, so that you have enough time to get to know them and their character and they get to know you and, um, and then, and then maybe if, if it looks, but see, that's the whole question is like, you have to discern at every moment, like, where is this going? Is this going anywhere? Is it not, or is there not a possibility? Um, yeah, it's too bad that the, that the most important things in human life are so darn complicated. But anyway, this is, this is part of what it means to be human, I suppose. Uh, it's, uh, yeah. Yes. 
going back to when you talked about um, silence and, and, and prayer, uh, the fact that like if we, especially as uh, as Christians living in modern world, need to unplug from media and sources of noise in order to more clearly hear the, uh, the voice of God. Uh, but uh, th there's this theme that I was reminded of um, in uh, some of these reflections on, um, I think it was uh, Cardinal Sirach's book, The Power of Silence, mm. where um, like that's kind of the, the first level of difficulty, the first set of obstacles is like unplugging from the world's noise and going into that place of solitude. But then mm -hmm. it's, there seemed to be a section in which uh, there's identified a second set of obstacles, where mm -hmm. once you get to that place of silence and isolation apart from the world, there can be this tendency to backfill the silence that you now have with a different kind of noise. Yes, exterior noise. internally generated. Exactly. Yes. Uh, and so I guess I was just uh, hoping to get kind of your, your thoughts and your um, um, reflections on dealing with those sorts of things <laughs> coming to deeper prayer at that level. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's, that is a great question um, because the, the interior noise in some ways is, is much harder to get rid of. I mean, uh, that is, it, it, it might be difficult in one sense to make a commitment to not being surrounded with visual and sonic noise all the time. But even once you make that decision, it's not so easy just to decide not to have interior noise. Um, and, and by interior noise, we can, we can mean all sorts of things like, like the, the, the sort of constant oscillation of thoughts, uh, the, the, um, the memory of past events or of people or of conversations or whatever that can often crowd our minds when we're alone. Um, you know, I don't know, just there is so much, so much within us that's churning around. Um, and it seems to me that what's really helpful there is to try to find things to do that will calm you. Um, that is not just to sit there and stew, but but for, so for instance, for me, what really calms me is praying the divine office. And I find that like, even if, I'm, even if my mind is really racing at 100 miles an hour for some reason, if I sit down, I, so I light some candles. I, I mean, I'll just tell you, I, in my room I have a big icon of Christ. There's a big Byzantine icon, it's like this big, it's on a board. Uh, and then I have in front of it a bunch of little icons and I have candles in front of all these things. And just, just the act of going and lighting all the candles and then sitting down, I have a kneeler, and, and just opening up a book and, and just starting to pray the Psalms in Latin is like is so incredibly calming <laughs> for me that you know within within a few moments you know things have really settled down and I think what 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 one is doing there is is like trying to substitute um, some kind of divine some kind of divine music for the noise that comes from inside uh, in other words it's not always easy to go from 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 the world to complete silence sometimes you have to pass through something like praying the psalms or or praying a rosary or whatever it is that's going to calm you and get you into a di get you to a different place if i can you say it that way um, for some people you know opening up uh, a bible and just reading a, you know some verses from the gospels or or, or from the psalms the psalms are amazing um, when you when you really open yourself to them there's there's so much there um, but, you know, so I think that's what I mean by saying find different things that will work for people. I also have heard it recommended, and I, th I mean, I don't know, I haven't tried it so much in the way that it was recommended to me, but some, some people have recommended, you know, buying some beautiful icon, not necessarily a, a handmade one, because those can often be hundreds of dollars uh, or more, but like a good reproduction of a classic icon, and, and just sitting and just gazing at that for a while and just sort of not trying to think about it, not trying to analyze it, certainly not analyze it, but just like look at the gaze and just try to be drawn into that gaze. Um, I think that that's, you know, icons can be, can be very, very, very helpful in that way. So, yeah. Yes, back there. Oh, no, no. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, so I don't know if you caught the end of my talk, uh, but I, I did address that to a certain extent just by saying that basically like, God wants us to settle into a state of life because that's where we're going to mature, that's where we're going to come to our fullness as Christians, and that's where we're going to be able to serve him best. Um, and, and so the period prior to making that decision it's not like you should try to end it as quickly as possible because you don't want to just make random, you know, like random decisions. But, but it's not something that should be prolonged. It's not something. It's it's actually. I mean, I'm just going to go out on a limb here and say I think it's actually dangerous to prolong the period of single life. Um, and why do I say that? Because the older we get, the harder it is to change and to adapt ourselves to the state of life that God is calling us to. I mean, this is, this is very, very familiar in religious communities. Like most religious communities will not take somebody who's older than 30 or 35 because their attitude is, you're already formed. You're, you, you have all your habits, your whole everything. We're not going to be able to form you to be a Dominican or a Jesuit or a Franciscan or a Benedictine or whatever. You're too old, you know? And of course, that sounds kind of harsh because actually you're not really that old, you know, in terms of like a regular human life. But you're old enough that you're not really malleable anymore to, to become a part of a whole. And marriage is a whole that's made up of parts. And the parts, the sooner the parts can get together, the sooner they can form the whole. And the sooner they can, and, and it just seems like, just like physically speaking, we're sort of more flexible and more energetic when we're younger and we get less flexible and less energetic as we get older. That's true psychologically as well. Like when we're younger, we're more flexible and we're more, we can put up with more, we can suffer more. I mean, that, that sounds like, but I mean, you know, that, that is where we just have more capacity, I think, for adapting to a new way of life that's going to demand a lot of us. Um, and then, then there's just the, the simple fact that, you know, that younger parents have more energy, you know, and it's easier for them to have children and, uh, and to take care of them. And so I think that when you look at it, it's just, it makes sense in God's plan that, that we would become, like we would, we would get married or, or enter seminary or enter a religious community rather younger than older. That just makes sense. Um, so that's, that's my answer to that question. And I, I, think, I think that it, if people reflect on it, if they kind of let themselves reflect on it, they'll realize, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, but the world has a different message. I mean, the world's message is very much about you, you, you know, about me, 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 right? And so like, you gotta, you know, you do you, right? You have to like go, you know, and like excel and get lots of money and like, you know, have fun and all these. And basically what that's doing is it's sacrificing, it's, it's sacrificing a person's future happiness and fulfillment for a momentary kind of fulfillment. Um, it's, it's, it's subordinating the good of the whole to the good of the part, which is not, which is not reasonable to do. What I mean by that is it's sub the, the good of marriage and family is higher and superior to the good of individuals. And we should think that way. That should be our, our way of thinking. But in modern times, it's so individualistic, nobody thinks that way. right? So, it's, 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 so I guess what I'm saying is it's, it's very easy for us to become subtly infected with that individualistic way of thinking and we need to uh, try to push that push that away so yeah yes uh, regarding music I'm just wondering somebody had to say it <laughs> so with, with stuff like you know, rock rap metal whatever so in, in general would you just consider those like lower forms of music Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I guess my, my basic position about that, as I, as I outlined it here, is that um, music is an art form. It's, a, it's, an, it's an art form with many ingredients to it, many aspects, and that it's an art form that has been developed in those aspects in very rich ways, both, both in popular ways, in folk, in the folk uh, genre, 
and in high culture ways in what we call classical, even though that's kind of a misnomer because there are, there are many types of artistic music and classical is just one style in that sphere. Um, and, and so given this heritage that we have that has developed the, the art of music to such a high degree, um, and, and given that that development took place because of Christianity, explicitly because of Catholicism, really, um, we as Catholics, we should view ourselves as heirs, as, in, as inheritors of that heritage, and we should try to embrace it just like we want to do with the traditional Latin Mass. You know, um, I think we should view ourselves also as the custodians and the, um, well, the custodians of tradition, dare I use that expression. Uh, so we, you know, we should, but I mean, custodian is not such a, a great word in English because it makes it, makes it sound like a museum curator, but, but, um, but as, as heirs and as, as grateful um, beneficiaries of it and as contributors to it, which is easier to do in the sphere of folk music. I mean, like any, anybody can learn, not anybody, but, like you could, if, but if, you, if you work hard enough, you can learn the banjo and you can play some great things on the banjo, you know, and, and folk music in that sense is very accessible. You know, my daughter ha plays the guitar, folk guitar really well, and she's writing folk songs. And it's just, it's great to see her kind of flourishing in that, in that vein, which is not mine. My vein, when I write music, it's sacred choral music. So it, it takes a different form, but the creativity is there. And, and the desire to be part of a larger tradition is there. And the, the, the simple fact of the matter is when you study the history of 20th century music, in almost every respect, 20th century music turned its back on tradition, on the Christian Catholic heritage of the fine art of music. It did that in the, in the sophisticated sphere with atonal music, with you know, composers who were trained classically, but who decided to write like horribly dissonant modernist music. Right? That was one kind of rejection. And the reaction to that rejection, part of the reaction to it, was people saying, if that's what they're going to do in the concert hall, we're getting out of here, and we're not going to do that anymore. So, that, so there was a kind of rejection of the classical tradition because it had sort of exploded um, thanks to modernism. Uh, thank you, modernism, uh, for, for another trade wreck. Uh, and, and then similarly, at the same time, there were, there were some types of popular music, like jazz, I would say, is the main, main influence here, that were much more, let's say, um, like they were, they were, they had, they had a, the passions were being more released more freely in this kind of music. Uh, and it, it was not going to be long before people would just start to throw off one boundary after another. I mean, that's what happens morally speaking. We can all see that in the area of sexual morality. And my argument that it also happens in music as well, and that these things are somewhat related to each other. Not, not exactly one for one, but there's a, there's a kind of like, if culture declines, it's going to decline in multiple areas. And that I think is what we've seen. So I, I just believe that, that we should be, actually we should be proud of our heritage, our artistic heritage, and we should want to know it, and we should, and, and we should actually make an effort to get to know it, because it is great, and it is beautiful, and it actually is appealing. It's just that you have to, you have to sort of get over the initial, I mean, I think a lot of t today's popular music is like candy, right? It's like very sweet and gives like an immediate hit, a, a, an immediate impact, and so it's very easy to consume it and to consume too much of it. And when you listen to something like Baroque music, like Vivaldi or Handel or Bach, initially it's, it's like eating like a very refined French meal. You know, it's like, it's very, it's like you have to get used to it. You have to, to understand that, okay, now I'm doing something different. And after a while, you actually start to say like, oh, I like this. I like this better than the candy, you know? But it still requires a kind of, of psychological effort to get to that point. For some people, other people, it happens more quickly, but, and more easily. So that's my, I hope that was somewhat of an answer to your question. Yeah. 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 Okay, good. Great. Well, shall we, uh, shall we, why don't we break up the uh, formal part of this and then we can all just get water and just kind of mingle, you know? So good. Thank you for your questions. Very good questions.